Let's first say a short prayer. Lord God, thank you for this word, and please speak to us because of it, and through it, and by it, and take your, the words that will be spoken from your pulpit here, and take them even as they are human words, and apply them to us as your words. In Jesus' name, amen. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself, in the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. That's where we'll stop. Um, to go come back to this just a minute, but we're going through the, the Belgic Confession right now. The Belgic Confession, the signers back in 18, or excuse me, 1562, said they'd rather die than deny what it says. In fact, they got more specific. The signers declared, I think that put that up there good. The signers declared they would offer their backs to stripes, their tongues to knives, their mouths to gags, and their whole bodies to the fire, rather than deny the truth affirmed in this confession. All right, these are, these are no small matters that we believe in. And they're in uh, the Psalter Hymnal 817 and, and following. I encourage you to read through it. We're not going to go through all of it. But uh, this is, these are the truths that we stand on as a church and in the Reformed tradition. Um, and not only that, but it has a lot to say about Scripture, what we believe about Scripture. This is not just some sort of arbitrary book. This is an important book that shapes what we believe and how we think. And this proves itself in a lot of ways, actually. What we believe about the Bible has a direct impact on our lives. What you believe about Scripture has a direct, direct impact on how you live. There was one study that was done that found that working adults who believe in the literal truth of the Bible were more than twice as likely as those who do not take the Scriptures literally to pursue excellence in their work because of their faith. If you take this seriously, you're going to take your entire life seriously including your work. And this was demonstrable in, in a study that was even done. And the Belgian Confession covers the topic of Scripture. First thing that it says from Article 2, it says, We know God through nature and Scripture. There are two ways that we know God. There's two. And the first one is through nature, the created order. You can just look around and you can see the marvels of God. There's two books, if you will, and the first is a general revelation of God's creation and providence. Just this past week, we had an eclipse. How many of you saw that? Okay, pretty amazing, pretty incredible. Um, one of my pastor friends was in that area where there was that path of totality, and he said it was, it was even more incredible there when, you know, the, the shadow of the moon comes over and you can see, you can see the sun's, you can see, I forget the, the technical term of it, but thank you. Um, you can see it in, in a new way. And it's like all of nature just changes right there. He said it was really cool. We can see God in, in nature. So in Psalm 19, 1 and 2, it says... The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. And then it goes on to say, there's, there's nowhere in the world where their voice does not go out. So everybody, everybody can see that there's a God out there. For example, creation is orderly. You can see from the order of creation... That the Creator is orderly. The creation is beautiful. You can see that, therefore, that our Creator is beautiful and appreciates beauty. It's intricate. You can go down 
all the way to cells and, and atoms that, by which the whole universe is held together. You can tell that the Creator is meticulous and detail-oriented, but it's also vast. Stars, galaxies, supernova, it just, there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of vastness to this creation. We can tell from that that this Creator is larger than life. But creation doesn't tell us some things. For example, why are we here? What's our, what's our purpose in life? We, we don't know that from just looking around. We can't tell that. Or is there one God or is there a lot of gods? From creation, we can't tell. In fact, most societies around the world, from uh, the most primitive and, and forward, they thought that there were lots of gods. So we can't just tell that from creation. We, we don't know what sin is or how it alienates us from God. We, we need scripture to tell us that. Or what is salvation and how to obtain it. So from just creation, there's a lot of things that we don't know. And uh, I've had an argument put at me before, and I want to bring it up to you. i got a picture on the screen here to show this. There's, if you have a bunch of blind men and they're all touching an elephant in different places and they all think that an elephant means something different. All right? One touching the tusk, it's a spear. One touching the trunk, it's a snake. A leg, it's a tree. The side, it's a wall. You know? So I've had people tell me that God is like this. And that all of the religions of the world are just touching a different piece of God. And we just really need to take them all together. And all religions are basically the same and that sort of a thing. All right? Well, if you were only going off creation, you might have an argument there. If creation was all that we had, you might be able to make that argument. And people do make this argument. So be prepared for people to throw this at you. But what if... In this analogy, this elephant could talk. What if in this analogy, the elephant can say to them, you know what, you're all wrong. Let me tell you what I'm like. Here, here you go. I'm gonna to explain to you what I am and what I'm like and what I'm about and how to get out of my way when I'm on a rampage and other things like that how to appreciate me, how to enjoy me, right? If this elephant could talk, then we wouldn't be needing this. There wouldn't be that confusion. And that's what the Bible is. The Bible is God himself speaking. In that analogy, the elephant can talk. And he has spoken. And we have what he says right here. So we can know God. We're not just guessing. We're not just feeling. We're not just trying to put stuff together based on what we can see around us. God has spoken. And we can know who He is. It says in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So this is not just somebody's experience of God. All right? This is God speaking to us. It's more than just somebody having an experience of God and then writing it down. Look at how Jesus describes this here. If you still have your Bibles open, I'm going to read that again. Look at verse 36. David himself, in the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Okay, that's Psalm 110. And Jesus is quoting it. But look at how he writes this. David himself, in the Holy Spirit, declared. All right? That is very telling. It was David who wrote, but it was by the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say David didn't write it. David wrote it. 
But he was in the Holy Spirit when he wrote it. This is not just David talking. This is God talking in the Holy Spirit. In fact, David even acknowledged this. I mean, David wrote many of the Psalms. He, it, what, this, is, this is on his deathbed. And this is one of the things he says on his deathbed. The Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. It's like he knew it. He had a sense that he wasn't just writing his own stuff. He was, he was writing what God told him to write. Now, the Bible did not float down from heaven. Okay? There was still a man named David, and he still put a pen to paper. All right? The Bible didn't float down from heaven. The writers wrote in their personal styles, but God guided their every word so that what we have is God's word, even though it was written by people. All right? Did you get that? The Bible didn't float down from heaven. There were still people, human beings, who wrote stuff down. And you can tell their personalities and their styles and stuff like that. But God guided their every word so that what we have is not just human opinions. We have God's word to us. The Bible is God's written word. Divine writings by mortal pens, if you want to put it that way. But that's maybe one way you could put it. Divine writings by mortal pens. This is from God to us. Each book, each epistle is dif- distinct. It has, it has human characteristics. And there are different styles. There's different vocabularies. There's different levels of education and, and different personalities you can tell. You know, Galatians is, is really mad. You can tell that. Philippians is very joyful, and it's pretty obvious. But uh, you can even tell that there's different intellectual and educational levels here. I mean, when I translate Hebrews, I have to look up like every other word because the vocabulary is so vast. When I'm translating James or John, I don't have to look up that much because he's writing in a different sort of a way. He's using common words. James is very direct, and it's about action. Hebrews is very intellectual and very scholarly. You can tell that they're written by different people. So there's a humanness of the book, just like there was a humanness to Jesus. But this Jesus isn't just human. The Bible isn't just human. It's divine. Divine writings by mortal pens. Belgian Confession, Article 3, says this, Therefore we call such writings holy and divine scriptures. That's not on your outline, but I wanted to put that in front of you. Yes, they were written by humans, but we call them holy and divine scriptures. This is not just an ordinary book. Not just somebody's imagination. The Bible reveals heavenly truths in human words, and it's all God's word. Not just certain parts. It doesn't just contain God's word. It is God's word. Okay, so these, there are 66 books in this Bible, Old Testament and New. A question. How do we know that these 66 books are from God and not many other books that were written a long time ago? There was a lot of things written over the years. How do we know that these 66 are God's word and not... Other things that were written. Right? How do, how do we know? That's a legitimate question. Well, the simple answer is the same way that people recognize the authority of Jesus' teachings. The same way. In Mark 1, it says, They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. When he spoke, he spoke from personal experience. He was from heaven. So when he's talking about heaven, he's saying it firsthand. When the scribes or myself, as just a human pastor, I'm only going off of what I'm reading here. All right? But Jesus, when he spoke, he spoke from firsthand experience. He's like, let me tell you what it is like. All right? I can't do that. I can only go off what's written. 
And I can only teach you as best I can. But Jesus, he was there. And he knows it. Okay? Oh, I lost my place here. Okay. Here's, here's, what, here's how I describe it. If this, if this was a Catholic church, and I was a Catholic priest, I would be telling you today that these books have authority because the church decided that they had authority. That's what I would be teaching. If I was a Catholic priest and this was a Catholic church, I would be saying that these books have authority because the church decided that they do. So the church gives authority to the scripture. What I'm going to tell you, what we believe here, is that the Bible has its own authority. The Bible has its own authority. The church doesn't give it authority. It has its own it's what you would call, the Bible is self-authenticating. It, uh, it authenticates itself. It tells us itself that it's from God. It speaks with a different voice than another pastor or another person. It's self-authenticating. It commands its own authority. You pick this up and you read it and you can't help but think, this is from God. This is not just another person. Look at uh, how, how the Belgian Confession puts it here. I like the way it put, writes this. And we believe without a doubt all things contained in them, not so much because the church receives and approves them as such, but above all, because the Holy Spirit testifies in our hearts that they are from God. It's the Spirit that testifies that they are from God. And also because, and I look at the second way that th this could be translated here. They carry the evidence thereof in themselves. The Bible has its own evidence in the way it speaks and how it speaks because of what the Spirit does with it. So, there is authority there. And it's not because the church says so, it's because it says so. Here's something that I want to mention to you today. The church did not meet and decide which books are going to be in the Bible. That decision didn't happen. The church simply recognized and recognizes still to this day and acknowledges its authority. It has its own authority. We simply follow it. Look at how Paul in 1 Thessalonians puts this. When you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Okay, 1 Thessalonians might be the first thing of the New Testament that was ever written. So when this was written, there was no New Testament. And yet, what Paul is saying is that when you received our message, the message of Jesus and salvation, you accepted it as the word of God, not just another person's word. And this word is at work in you believers. So there's a message that went out and produced the church. Before the church even existed, there was the word of God that is, we call the message of Jesus. Before it was even written down, that's what started the church. The church doesn't make the Bible. The Bible makes the church. All right? There's a distinction. The Bible makes the church, not vice versa. The books of the New Testament, there's 27 of them, okay? A little bit of history. The 27 books of the New Testament emerged organically by consensus of the church over the centuries. There was never a meeting to decide, okay, which ones are we going to say are the Bible and which ones are we not? And we're going to impose that on everybody else. If you think that, then you've been reading the Da Vinci Code or some other books like that a little too much. Okay? There was never a decision by the church to say, okay, these books are in and these books are out. 
There were some local decisions, but the church never got together and said, these are in, these are out. That never happened. The church didn't decide that arbitrarily. There was no decision about an official New Testament list of books. What actually happened is this. The Gospels and the Epistles were written in the first century by people who knew Jesus and had met him and heard what he taught. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written in the 50s through 70s, arguably somewhere in there. John was written somewhere between 70 and 95. The last book to be written was Revelation, somewhere between 90 and 95. And then a lot of other things started to be written later. Here's some of them. Gospel according to the Hebrews, according to the Egyptians, Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Peter, Gospel of Mary, Gospel of Truth. Why don't you hit the next one there? Infancy, Gospel of Thomas, Acts of John, Acts of Paul, Shepherd of Hermas, 3 Corinthians, 1 Clement, 2 Clement, a treatise on the resurrection, the Didache. There's more I could go into. But there were lots of other writings. What happened was actually really remarkable. When lists were made, they were of books that the churches were already using. The church recognized that some of these books had authority and other ones did it. Organically. They weren't told. They just recognized that these ones had authority and these ones did it. So some of those other books... Some of them are good reads. It's worth reading. It's not, it's not bad. Some of them, though, are pretty messed up. All right? And I would, if you want specific examples, I mean, it says stuff that it's like, how could Jesus say something like that? Like, for one example, I have, I have a bunch here. I'm just going to read one. Uh, the Gospel of Thomas has Jesus saying this. If you fast... You will give rise to sin for yourselves, and if you pray, you will be condemned, and if you give alms, that's like uh, giving money to the poor, you will do harm to your spirits. That's directly at variance with what Jesus actually said. Okay? You can tell that these were written later by people who didn't know Jesus and didn't experience his teachings. That's just one example. If you want more, talk to me afterwards. Okay, churches started to make lists of books to be official, but even then there were some disagreements about which ones were in and which ones were out. It took a while for the church to figure out, okay, these these are from God, these ones aren't. So like, for example, in around 190 AD, we received the revelations, that's the revelation, of John and Peter, though some of us are not willing that the latter be read in church. We're not so sure about the gospel of, or the revelation of Peter yet. We know about the revelation of John, but not Peter. We're still unsure about that one. Or here's early third century. Peter left behind one letter that's acknowledged, first Peter, and possibly a second, for it is disputed. Okay? It took a while. But it happened organically. There was never a church decision. These are in, these are out. The first time the current 27-book New Testament was listed was in AD 367 by one bishop in Alexandria, Egypt. That was the first time. It was by 367 that the church's consensus was starting to become together. But what I want to impress upon you is this. That's just a little bit of history. This is what I want you to remember. Miraculously, the 27-book New Testament is agreed upon by Christians worldwide. You get a bunch of Christians together, and there's a lot of things that they can disagree about. But they all agree that these 27 books are from God. East and West, Protestant and Catholic, even... Even these cults, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they still have the same New Testament. How is that possible? Well, it's kind of simple. These have authority from God. The other ones don't. (coughs) 
Belgian Confession, Article 7, says this, Scripture is sufficient for our faith. There's other books that might be worth reading. It's not like you can only read the Bible. That's not what we're saying. But Scripture is sufficient to form your faith. For all of the purposes of your faith, Scripture is enough. Scripture is enough. You can read other books. They might be worth reading. But only the Bible is God's Word. All right? Just the Bible. The Bible contains God's will completely, and everything needed for salvation is taught in it. If anybody tells you to be saved or to know God, you need the Bible plus something else, they're wrong. It's Scripture that we need. Scripture is sufficient. You got to read this other book. Well, maybe you can read that other book, but that's not God's Word. There's only one God's Word, and it's this one. And I hope that you read it as well. Look at how uh, the Belgian Confession puts it. We believe that this Holy Scripture contains the will of God completely, and that everything one must believe to be saved is completely or sufficiently taught in it. For since the entire manner of service, which God requires of us, is described in it at great length, No one, not even an apostle or an angel from heaven, as Paul says in Galatians 1, ought to teach other than what the Holy Scriptures have already taught us. So if any book that you read contradicts Scripture, goes against it, undermines it, adds to it or subtracts from it, it's wrong. Okay? It's forbidden to add or subtract from the Word of God. Therefore, it's complete and it's perfect in all respects. Deuteronomy 12, verse 32. God said, Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take from it. So that was way back in Deuteronomy already. But there's some practical stuff here too. Okay, that's... That's just the the belief stuff. Here's some application stuff. There's power in reading the Bible. There's real power in just reading it that I can't fully describe. When you read the Bible, God's changing you. God's doing something in your life. He's working in your mind and in your heart in ways that I can't fully describe. Here's what what they they did find, though. They did one study, and they found that people who read the Bible four times a week, feeling lonely, dropped 30%. Anger issues dropped 32%. Bitterness in relationships dropped 40%. Alcoholism dropped 57%. Feeling spiritually stagnant dropped 60%. Viewing pornography dropped 61%. Sex outside of marriage dropped 68%. Sharing your faith jumped 200%. Discipling others jumped 230%. Four times a week, you read the Bible, your life has changed. You're a different person. You're being shaped and molded here just by reading it. So here's, here's how I would characterize it. I, I love God's Word, and I love diving into it, understanding it, trying to figure it out, and put it together in, in, in its whole, in its entirety. Um, here's, here's what I found in my experience. Whenever you read the Bible with an open mind, the Holy Spirit is working. Whenever I, whenever I open this, this book this Bible, and I read it, the Spirit's working in me and changing me in ways that I don't fully realize. But I realize it later. I realize that my attitudes change. My thoughts change. My values change. I care about certain things more and I care about other things less. You you read Scripture and it changes you. And it's not arbitrarily, it's by the Holy Spirit. 
The Spirit is doing that. Final thought for you. Other books might be helpful, but only the Bible is God's Word. When you do your devotional time, I hope that God's Word is a part of that. Because there's a lot of nice books out there, ones that are worth reading, but there's only one God's Word. And so when you do your devotions, I hope that God's Word is at least part of that. This is what changes you. Everything else is just supplemental. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Lord our God, thank you for your word that changes us and shapes us, makes us more like Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that we would read it, not because we must, but because we want to, because we see how you are drawing us closer to you through it. Um, Lord, I pray that for each person who's gathered here or who's watching, so that, uh, Lord, we would know you and love you as you truly are, not just as we might think you are. We pray everything in Jesus' name. Amen.